Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second meeting of the Social Security Committee of 2017. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones as it does interfere uh, with the recording system? Uh, our first item today in agenda, item one, is that we take items three and four in private. Is that agreed by the committee? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is the main item on the agenda today, and it's looking at an evidence session of employability and sanctions. Uh, I welcome Minister Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Employability and Training, uh, first visit this year to, to the committee, and welcome once again. Uh, along with the, the Minister is Michael Mickelhenny, I hope I pronounced that properly, thank you, Employability Programme Lead, and Julie Bellotti, uh, Policy Manager, Employability Policy Team in the Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, you want to make an opening statement? Uh, up to yes, uh, uh, indeed, you. Convener, and then of course, as ever, I'll be happy to to field any questions that the committee wants to, to throw at me. Uh, can I begin by thanking you for uh, the invitation to, to come along uh, today? I very much welcome the interest the committee has shown in our uh, employability programme, in particular how it might, uh, well, how it will not now uh, interact with the, the UK government's uh, sanctions uh, system. We'll just to uh, perhaps set out some of the, the background as to where we are with the employability programme, and then as I, I say, uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you want to, uh, to pose of me. Uh, uh, beginning, uh, I'd like to assure uh, the committee that we are uh, building uh, the employability programme on uh, a solid foundation uh, informed by uh, significant consultation that has taken place already and indeed a, an ongoing uh, process of consultation and discussion with uh, those with uh, expertise in the field of employability and a wide range of uh, stakeholders, those who uh, have provided similar services in uh, the past, those who may provide services in the future, and above all, and I think most importantly of all, uh, as I'm sure the committee would agree, the convener, those who have been uh, customers of the uh, predecessor programmes and those who are likely to be customers of our programme as it goes live uh, from April 2017. We're very much on track for delivery from uh, that juncture. Uh, we uh, undertook, as I said, uh, a full uh, consultation, a formal consultation uh, in 2015. Uh, the uh, response to that uh, highlighted a, a clear sense of uh, ambition and significant consensus uh, on uh, the future of employment support in uh, Scotland. There was a, a clear and consistent uh, view that Scotland can improve on the uh, services that have been uh, in place before that the UK government have uh, provided to better provide support that helps uh, people into work whilst operating in an environment that uh, respects the uh, dignity of those who engage with that service and uh, respect between customer and uh, provider. In responding to the consultation, we set out the, uh, the key values and principles of our uh, approach to employability. These are, uh, I believe, aligned with our wider ambitions for a, a fairer Scotland, underpinned by uh, the uh, Fair Work Framework that has been published by the Fair Work Convention and our commitment to fair work more uh, broadly. Of course, the labour market strategy, uh, which I uh, published uh, in August of last year, uh, which again was imbued with uh, an uh, approach to uh, what's fairer uh, work uh, and our determination to achieve more inclusive growth uh, across uh, Scotland, tackling inequality by supporting uh, those who really uh, need our help. And of course, there's also uh, a commitment to continually seek to review, uh, learn from the programmes we put in place and improve them uh, in uh, the future. Uh, as a basis of the uh, work underway, we've uh, set out key uh, strategic objectives. These are about establishing a distinctly Scottish employability service, designing and delivering a high quality, high performing uh, service that helps people into sustained jobs, treating them with, as I've said, fairness, dignity and respect. And uh, of course, focusing on those furthest uh, from the labour market, but for whom work uh, remains a realistic uh, prospect. Having a nationally consistent uh, service, but one delivered locally using a, a variety of um, uh, providers across the, the public third sector and the private sector capabilities and uh, trying to integrate and align uh, services uh, to both maximise value for money but also and critically importantly as part of the 
person-centred approach, make sure we get it right for those who engage with our a programme. As we move towards implementation, as I say, we continue to consult closely with a wide range of, of people on these matters that we have effective transfer development and design and delivery of these new powers, which I would remind the committee are, of course, the first from the Scotland Act to, to go live, as it were. Those we have engaged with include members of our, our stakeholder advisory group, customers, uh, as I've mentioned, and of course the representative bodies that uh, the potential customers may uh, engage with, particularly on matters around uh, disability. Third sector organisations and local government have also been important as part of that process of consultation. Uh, the, the context we operate in is of course uh, important between uh, 2011, uh, when the UK government implemented the work programme, and uh, uh, now there's uh, much has, has changed. Unemployment is uh, lower and employment rates are up, which is of course uh, welcome, but there are uh, many who uh, are still uh, removed from uh, the labour market who want and need uh, help to get into uh, work, and many of whom probably feel that that help has not been uh, properly forthcoming. Uh, and that, uh, at the same time, of course, the committee will be well aware of the funding challenges we have been set by the uh, significant uh, cut in funding for uh, contracted employment uh, support uh, from the UK government, and uh, these factors combined uh, 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 mean that it's incumbent on us to uh, have a new uh, approach uh, uh, to this uh, area. We are, of course, uh, moving quickly to the operational phase of the service um, from April 2017. This is uh, an important step. It's uh, an exciting time uh, during which I am very much committed to taking the opportunity to make employment services work differently here and more effectively here in uh, Scotland, uh, in order that we ensured uh, support continued for customers who needed it, uh, whilst this process of developing the uh, longer term service that we seek to implement, we have uh, put in place a transitional service from, for one year uh, from April. The contracts for uh, these are now uh, in place, uh, looking ahead to uh, 2018 after that uh, transitional year. I'm also confident we are on track to ensure uh, new services are in place from uh, that uh, juncture. Uh, we have, uh, as I've already mentioned, set out the broad uh, principles for such. Uh, critical from my uh, estimation, as it was very clear, I think, with the committee and correspondence, is that in common with the other employability and training initiatives that we offer, uh, this is a voluntary a service. I think that will build a greater a sense of, of confidence for those who engage with that programme. Um, there will be uh, various levels of support to those engaged with the programme. We recognise some people uh, might need less than others. There will be uh, specialist support for those who are uh, disabled. We have also, and we heard very clearly, that one of the perhaps unintended consequences of there not being a service fee in previous programmes was there was a perverse disincentive to reach out to those furthest removed from the labour market. The, the term picking the, the long hanging fruit was utilised. We think a service fee should remove that uh, disincentive and it should also allow for some of the, the smaller providers to feel more confident to come uh, in and uh, tender for our services. There will it still of course be payments for uh, job outcomes at various junctures, which I can uh, touch on later if uh, members are interested. I should say, uh, and uh, this is uh, something I'm announcing uh, today, uh, convener, uh, under my responsibility to announce these things to uh, Parliament, uh, first of all, um, so that uh, I'm accountable to Parliament. Uh, I thought I would use this committee appearance to make this uh, public. We have uh, determined that there will be nine contract package areas across Scotland for the services due to commence in 2018. That very much recognises, I think, the fact that uh, the type of service that people uh, may require will differ from area to area. It will also, again, mean because the contract package areas are smaller than have hitherto been the case. And um, it's uh, speculation, I suppose, if this service hadn't been devolved, given the way we see the contract package areas going in the rest of the United Kingdom, my suspicion uh, is that Scotland would have been a contract package area as a whole. Speculation, uh, I freely admit, but informed by what's happening 
uh, south of the border uh, and in uh, Wales. But with smaller contract package areas, I think we'll again embed confidence for smaller providers to feel confident to be able to, to come uh, forward. Um, in terms of uh, the area that I know is of uh, utmost interest to this committee around the area of sanctions, we have, uh, we will, this will be a voluntary service. Um, the committee is uh, aware, uh, following your uh, recent uh, dialogue, you had uh, um, Damien Green before you and then you corresponded with him that our approach will be respected by the DWP. Uh, indeed, I should say, convener, uh, Damien Green confirmed that in writing to you as a committee before he did uh, to me, but I was very glad he did because I did happen to notice his uh, letter to you. But I should say I, I have now myself had written confirmation uh, from the DWP. Uh, I think it is important, of course, to emphasise, uh, Convener, that um, that's not to say those who engage with our programmes will not be uh, necessarily subject to sanctions through the rest of their interaction with the DWP. Um, that remains the preserve of the UK government. We don't set that to policy area, but we did have clear confirmation from the UK government that the extent of conditionality um, and criteria in our devolved programme was ours. And from my mind, that meant being able to say that um, that programme shouldn't interact with uh, sanctions and um, that it has been respected, which I'm uh, very much welcome. Uh, the one uh, other area I think I should touch on uh, are two other areas, if you don't mind me touching on quickly, a convener is uh, the wider agenda of trying to integrate uh, this service. We have a, uh, there are challenges, as I've mentioned, around funding, but there is an opportunity here as well, a convener. We can seek to better integrate this employment programme with some of the other devolved functions we have, uh, health, justice, um, uh, indeed uh, with uh, other uh, partners with local government. We know that they provide uh, a range of employability initiatives. They have um, uh, departments for economic development. Indeed, social work can try and seek to better align uh, this uh, um, employment programme with that. And indeed, our own employability and training offer right up to modern apprenticeships. We can seek to try and better align uh, those services. Uh, that will be a, a longer term ambition. I readily concede it is easier said than done, but I am determined that we seek to do it. And that is why last month I announced a £1 million innovation fund, which we will can utilise to support testing of new models uh, of integration in different areas, so we can uh, very much learn uh, from that uh, experience. We also formed an integration alignment advisory group, which will help develop an integration and alignment action plan that we plan to publish in, I should see here in my speaking note, it says spring 2016. That's a typo, spring 2017. We've not missed any deadline. We'll be publishing that in spring of uh, this uh, year. The last thing I wanted to touch on, and this is very much uh, relevant at this uh, moment in time, uh, and I believe, I think I recall you had uh, witnesses from Job Centre Plus uh, about their uh, programme of closures at that stage for Glasgow specifically. Uh, of course, we uh, now, and I, and I should say, convener, I very much welcome the fact that uh, Damien Green came uh, to this committee. I used to be the deputy convener of the Welfare Reform Committee, the probably the predecessor committee to this one. We had significant challenges in getting any UK government can, uh, uh, minister to come uh, to speak to us publicly on the record. So uh, at least you've managed to achieve that, and I think that's welcome. Uh, what's been less welcome has been uh, the process in which the uh, Job Centre Plus closures have been uh, announced. Uh, and um, I, I've been dissatisfied with that for a number of reasons, primarily, of course, the impact on those uh, that will be affected in the uh, various uh, communities that these closures will uh, take place in. But, uh, of course, it's relevant to this programme because Job Centre Plus is going to be a key conduit for um, referral into our employment programme. And if uh, Job Centre Plus branches are closing, then that could have an impact on the ease with which people are referred into that programme. There's also an issue around uh, the Smith Agreement, paragraph 58 of uh, the agreement uh, set out, and uh, I can specifically quote from it, that we should identify ways to further link services through methods such as co-location wherever possible and establish more formal mechanisms to govern the Job Centre Plus network in Scotland. There have been uh, discussions at official level, there have been discussions between Skills Development Scotland and the DWP. I acknowledge that, but what I can 
say is I think that dialogue really has to be more meaningful and if we are to establish uh, what is set out in paragraph 58, uh, more formal mechanisms to govern the Job Centre Plus in Scotland between us as an administration and the UK <coughs> government, then I think uh, I, as the Minister for Employability and Training in the Scottish Government, finding out about Job Centre Plus closures through the pages of the Daily Record speaks of uh, the need, shall I be generous to say, uh, more significant work to be done in that regard. So it will be something I continue to pursue uh, with uh, the UK Government. Uh, that said, um, there are obviously issues around uh, that particular element of interaction, but I don't want to detract from where uh, we are. It can be there are uh, challenges. There are challenges around funding. There are uh, challenges around the long-term uh, agenda, integration agenda. There are opportunities. The integration agenda, as much as it's a challenge, is also a huge opportunity. We also have the opportunity to uh, create a very much a person-centred approach here and um, better support those who are furthest removed from uh, the labour market. That's my ambition for uh, this employment programme going uh, forward. We are very much on track to deliver this, the transition arrangements from April 2017, and I also believe we're on track to deliver a, a longer term approach from 2018 as well. And of course, at any stage the, uh, the uh, committee wants further updates, I'll be happy to provide them. Thank, thank you very much, Minister. You've covered a number of areas, obviously, and uh, obviously there's a number of questions to be asked too. Uh, the job centre one, you quite rightly say, uh, I think the committee would share your concerns, particularly the fact that, yeah, we did have Damien Green here, but two weeks later we were told there was other job centres closing, and we only found that out through the newspaper. So whilst we're very grateful that we managed to get government ministers here, uh, certainly it would be nice if we been told in advance that they were going to close. So that's something we need to look at, and certainly the job centre closures is something I think we we'll be, should be looking at in this committee also. If I could just raise a couple of issues which uh, have been raised by us, well, with us, with the uh, evidence session, and you touched on a number of them in regard to providers and also the fact that uh, you were looking at the different contract areas. Oh. These were certainly raised with us, particularly with local authority, with the Slade uh, Economic Development. Uh, I just wondered if you could perhaps expand more on what you mentioned there. You said that people will be contracting. There will be nine contract areas and you will be working with integrated services and services that are already there. Uh, but uh, the term, how long that would take, you weren't quite so sure. So perhaps you could you know, expand on that particular one. Uh, the agencies that are working just now in economic development, will they automatically be part of the people who bid for the contracts? And another issue we should raise with us was the costing of the contracts, service and providers. Uh, at the moment, it's 30%, 70%. And it was raised with us, with a number of voluntary organisations, that they would like to see a 50-50 percent split. So I just wonder if you could perhaps elaborate on that too. Okay. Um, just picking up, I know it was an opening remarks rather than part of the question, but just in terms of you welcoming the, the UK government minister attending, but not uh, you know, similarly to my own experience learning about the specific closures through the uh, the um, newspapers, uh, I suppose I would observe it's very much similar to our uh, interaction. It's welcome we have the interaction, but it really has to be uh, meaningful. And I think, uh, um, you know, words are, are, are easy. So if we meet face to face, then certainly when I meet face to face with UK government ministers, I want it to be meaningful interaction. And uh, hitherto, I think it's questionable how around certain aspects of this process, how meaningful it's been. And I'm sure you as a committee might want to reflect on how meaningful your interaction might have been with the UK government. In terms of, I should say, I omitted to mention some elements in terms of the, the nine contract package areas, one of which is of particular importance, and I should announce today, we are going to also reserve one of the, the areas, contract package areas for supported business to, to tender for. I think that's an important thing to do because we, uh, I think it's an important area for us uh, to support. So that's uh, something else I can announce today. We have not finalised yet which of the specific areas it will be, and I can run through uh, the, the nine contract package areas if, if people would uh, like to me, me to, to do that, uh, and I'm sure they will. 
Um, but uh, we will make a further announcement about which one of the, the nine uh, areas that uh, reservation will uh, apply to. In terms of uh, the uh, process of, of tendering, there will be no uh, automatic process. It will be very much incumbent on those who seek to tender for our services to, to build a tender and then, then bid for them. Um, I, I did already set out that that can be across a range of sectors, so there's no uh, automatic switch for anyone to say they will be part of the, the process uh, for uh, tendering. What we have done is we've engaged extensively uh, with the sector uh, uh, in terms of setting out uh, our high-level ambitions, speaking to them about how that could be practically uh, applied. They've been hugely uh, instructive. And incidentally, we've done that across a range of locations across the country to make sure we're, we're trying to... Uh, to uh, meet as many of these organisations as is possible and, and making it as convenient as them for possible. But they've been hugely instructive in terms of um, us shaping the, the final nature of the contract package areas and it will be uh, instructive in uh, informing what our finder, final tender documents, which we expect to go to tender in March uh, and we'll publish at that stage, uh, what they will uh, look like. In terms of the issue around the service fee, uh, I would um, say, uh, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll continue to speak to folk and, and hear what they have to say. I think I would ask people to reflect on the fact that the uh, predecessor uh, to this programme had uh, no uh, service fee. So um, this is an, uh, uh, literally an infinite uh, increase in terms of the level of service fee that went before, you know, this is going to continue to be a learning process for us. So uh, this will not be the only time in the future that we tender for services. So we will need to, to learn from this uh, first uh, set of contracts that we put in place. Uh, and we will we'll continue to hear what those who uh, are our providers say about that. But I think, broadly speaking, we've, we've got it right. There, I think, would be an expectation that there should be some form of payment by outcome because at the end of the day we want there to be uh, positive outcomes through this program and ultimately an employment program the positive outcome for an employment program is people getting into sustained employment so there'll be other uh, trigger points whereby people will receive further uh, payments at three months six months and 12 months which I, again i think is is a fairly generous approach so uh, at three months, uh, contractors will get a, a further payment. Six months, they'll get a further payment. And if they can sustain someone into employment for 12 months and beyond, they'll get that, that final payment. But uh, I think the service fee we're embedding is, um, I think, has been welcomed uh, across the board. And uh, as has, I think, from the sector, I should say, as has been our decision to disaggregate the employment programme from facilitating the sanctions uh, regime but we will, this will be a constant process of learning. But right now, I think 30% sounds about right. Thank you for being upfront and honest in, that, in answering that particular question. It did come from some of the voluntary services there. Adam Tomkins, you wanted to come around the back yeah, of that one? Uh, th thank you, Minister, and thank you for your um, very full opening statement. There are a couple of areas of that statement that I wanted to pick up with you, if I may. First, about um, uh, local authorities. Um, one of the things that we heard in evidence last week that I think struck a lot of us, certainly struck me, um, was uh, the statement from one of our witnesses that this is a very cluttered landscape. Um, and so one of the things I think that we would be interested in is knowing how it might be decluttered. Uh, and uh, as you know, Minister, devolution complicates things further, it clutters things further. Uh, that's not to imply that I'm opposed to it, because I'm not. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I, I wondered if you had any reflections first on that general statement that this is a very cluttered landscape and whether the Scottish Government have any proposals um, that you could share with us uh, as to how it might be decluttered. Um, I think I would concede at the point that there is already, um, well, we could use the terminology cluttered uh, landscape. There's a lot of different initiatives and programmes in place. I think all of them in of themselves, for, for good reason, the specific programmes are in place. I think we should be 
relaxed about there being different programmes, different approaches to suit local needs and local purposes. That's why we've gone to yeah. um, uh, more localised um, contract package areas for this uh, programme. I think what the issue, and this is where I would agree with the perspective, is that for uh, providers and above all for those who seek to interact with those services, the landscape cannot always be that clear. And that exists as much in terms of some of the... Well, to, let me be can, further candid still. You know, when I came into office uh, as the Minister for Employability and Training in May, I was immediately beset with this range of new programmes and it took me a, a, a little while to get my head uh, around them. Hopefully I have done so much successfully now a few months down uh, the line. So I think what that speaks of, and that's why I think the integration agenda is so important, integration with other uh, services such as the health service, the justice system, as I say, through local government, social work, but also for the entire gamut of uh, employability training initiatives. We need to uh, try and integrate them rather better with one another. Now, that's not to put flags in the ground and say we want to reclaim things back from local government. Um, there's no ambition to do that, but I did meet with Harry McGuigan, who's the relevant spokesperson for who Mr Griffin will know it very well, as I do, with him being a North Lanarkshire uh, councillor. Uh, I met uh, Councillor McGuigan uh, some months ago, uh, and he's the relevant spokesperson for this uh, policy area. And you know, he, he shared the perspective, and there was a willingness for us to get round the table to to try and engage in further dialogue to make sure we can make it a more seamless process, ultimately for the person on the ground seeking to interact with all these services. That's got to be the, the fundamental thing, the most important thing. It's a lot easier said than done, and I'll concede that at the outset. This It's not going to be in place from April 2017. It's probably not likely to be entirely in place by April 2018. It'll be an ongoing process, and it's one that is of the utmost importance to me, and I think of the utmost importance to the success we will have, or otherwise, in terms of uh, getting people into sustained employment through the, the various programmes, including this employment programme, in uh, the long run. Of course, I would observe we've, uh, and I've already mentioned, the £1 million of funding for, for um, alignment and integration to test things out. And again, that'll, that'll help inform our thinking. So... Hopefully that's a fulsome enough answer for you it, at this stage, Mr Tompkins. Indeed, can we can just drill down on one aspect of it, of course. it which is the relationship between um, your new Employability Programmes Minister and Skills Development Scotland, and the relationship generally between employability programmes and skills. You said in your opening remarks that aligning um, employability with, for example, modern apprenticeships is a longer-term ambition. Mm -hmm. um, aligning, decluttering, I think, are obviously uh, quite closely re related to one another. So can you, can you just help us understand a little bit how... Skills Development Scotland will work with uh, the um, uh, organisations that win the nine contracts or contract areas that you're um, going to put out to tender in the next few, next little while? Well, of course, some of that might emerge in the tenders themselves because um, it, there is a, a national, nationally consistent service, but it can be delivered differently in local areas. So that could emerge in the tender for those bidding as to how they may themselves set out how they would seek to interact with a variety of organisations, including Skills Development Scotland. Before I expand on that, can I just go back to say it is um, a longer term agenda. I'm being quite candid about that in terms of uh, integration and alignment. It's a longer term agenda because if we're going to get it right, we don't want to, to rush it and, and get it wrong. That's not to say it isn't an immediate priority. So it is something that we're already uh, determined to take forward and we'll start taking forward uh, 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 as quickly as, as we can. Indeed, we're, we're already on that agenda through the dialogue we're engaging in. So when I say it's a long-term agenda, I don't want to give the sense that that's, that means it's in the long grass. I think it's just uh, more a, 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 imbuing a sense of realism about the approach we need to take to getting it right. In terms of skills developed in Scotland, again, they're, they're, it's, it's part of that wider alignment agenda. So they deliver a variety of initiatives that could be called part of the family of employability and training. They are going out to, uh, we asked them to uh, tender and contract for uh, the uh, employability fund for modern apprenticeships. They're engaging in that already. So 
they have a, a critical role, I suppose the name's in the tin, Skills Development Scotland, they have a, a critical role to play in uh, our uh, wider agenda of upskilling the population and getting them ready uh, for uh, the world of work. So they are part of uh, this agenda of alignment as well. Budget has been cut by £6.8 million, pounds, I think, in the current proposed budget. Can you guarantee, Minister, that there will be no closures uh, at all of any Skills Development Scotland uh, premises or offices or services, given that their budget has been cut by nearly £7 million? Pounds? Well, it's ultimately for Skills Development Scotland to look at their estate. Uh, I think I can see where you're going with this one, uh, Mr Tompkins, and I'm sure we'll pick up on this in due course. But uh, I know that Skills Development Scotland have a clear commitment whether or not they have a physical office on the ground uh, to engage with every community in Scotland. Uh, uh, by comparison to other organisations, I think it remains to be seen whether they share that commitment. Of course, Skills Development Scotland might be able to help them do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Griffins. Uh, thanks, Kavinar. Uh, Morning, Minister. I had um, some questions around um, conditionality and sanctions. Um, firstly, I welcome the government's approach um, that the programmes would be of a voluntary nature and there would be no conditionality. But you touched on the issue in your opening statement around interaction between the devolved programmes and reserve benefits and any conditionality sanctions attached with them. Is it possible through the tender for the government to design um, the programmes in such a way as uh, so that people who were attending those programmes were meeting the commitments um, that were set down um, by other reserve benefits in terms of their um, commitment to seek work or other, other commitments that they would make? Well, I think the difficulty with that, Mr Griffin, is if we did that, then it becomes a mechanism by which a person could be sanctioned for not participating. So um, that therein lies the, the difficulty for us, because that would become facilitating the, the sanction system. I suppose my comments at the outset were to remind, to make clear to people, because there could be a danger, there could be a tendency for people to think, well, there's not going to be sanctions in Scotland anymore. Well, I, I can't commit to uh, the, uh, the altering the UK government system of sanctions because it's for the UK government to do what I could commit to do and what I sought to do. And, of course, it wasn't just the Scottish government's perspective, it was this parliament's perspective, not unanimously, I accept, but overwhelmingly, that this devolved uh, employment programme shouldn't facilitate the UK government sanction system I, incidentally, of course, we, um, I will always seek to uh, secure the support of Parliament. That this was, uh, this was, we could have done this by um, executive prerogative. But um, I thought it was very important that I was able to go to Damien Green and say, this isn't just the Scottish government's perspective; it's the perspective of the Scottish Parliament uh, as well. And we've managed to successfully get the DWP into position where. They have stuck to uh, the principles they set out over a significant period of time where they said the, the conditions in the devolved employment programme were for us, the Scottish Government, to uh, determine. And I took that to include interaction with the sanction system. For some time it wasn't entirely clear whether or not that would be respected. But I have to take uh, Damien Green and Damien Hines, who was the UK minister who confirmed to me Damien Green confirming to this committee. I have to take them at their word and they say they will respect our view that our programme should be voluntary. I accept what the Minister is saying in terms of not wanting to facilitate um, any sanctions, but there could be a person who would be sanctioned for um, not seeking work or whether they attend the, the Scottish Government programme or not, they could be sanctioned. I was just wondering if there's any way of um, automatic almost an automatic fulfilment, um, an agreement between DWP um, and yourselves that anyone who is attending is automatically um, under no threat of sanctions or in reserved areas as well? Uh, we, can, we could certainly explore that further. I think we just need to be very cautious about that because the flip side of that could then be argued to people well, if they don't uh, attend then they're subject to, to sanction. I, I see the point that you're driving at um, we can explore it for the DWP, but I can't leave here with a commitment to say that the DWP will agree to that. Thank you. 
Goodman, just a minute. Yes, uh, Minister, I welcome some of the things you've been saying, and um, as you've said, <laughs> well, that, that may come as no surprise. Um, but uh, you, you mentioned this being a learning process and so forth in respect to certain areas. Uh, what I'm interested in, you've clearly decided, as you say, on the voluntary approach rather than a sanctions or a conditionality uh, approach to matters. My question is, what plans do you have for evaluating how that approach is working and also a reassessment of the approach itself and the, the mechanisms that are employed and um, what I would say clearly we um, will have an on I mean, if we're going to learn from our programme then ongoing uh, evaluation it has to uh, be part of uh, that uh, process um, we are uh, monitoring uh, sorry we are developing a a monitoring and evaluation plan to, to set it how we will do that fully. But I wouldn't want anyone to, on this committee or uh, out there, first of uh, this committee, to have the feeling that we're not going to uh, continuously assess the efficacy of the approach we take. It also um, occurs to me that uh, this committee or any committee of uh, Parliament could call for me to come before them to uh, to answer questions about how our approach is working. Um, this is also uh, involves disburs disbursement of the public purse, so Audit Scotland will probably take an interest in this uh, and that will cast further light on it. But we will have our own uh, independent evaluation of the uh, approach we uh, take. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the principle involved uh, about our determination to that we have managed to success, get successful agreement uh, from the DWP that they will respect to take a voluntary approach. That is consistent with the other programmes that we offer and I think they have uh, good outcomes. I think they allow for people to engage with them on a, with greater confidence. Uh, I certainly know through the customer feedback sessions that we took forward there was a significant concern about uh, the potential for being sanctioned through engaging with uh, the predecessor programs uh, around the uh, the rigidity of them that that uh, can uh, imply and i just don't think we're going to get the best out of people if, if they're engaging in a program um, with that level of anxiety, I don't think we're going to get as good an outcome at the end of it. But of course, it will be incumbent on us to uh, evaluate if we want to continue to learn from the uh, the, uh, the approach we are taking. And I will readily commit to to this committee right now that that will be part of the the process we take forward. Yes, I mean, that I suppose there's two things. One is the the particular principle you're committed to, which may be a political decision or may be based on a particular view of evidence. And then the, the other issue is how that principle is applied and how it works within the system. So there are two aspects to it. And uh, I would have thought you would certainly be able to commit to reviewing how it is working in tandem with other matters. And I'm just wondering if there's a time scale in terms of you know when we'll get some comment on how it's considered to be working and what might be able to be uh, adjusted or improved in how it works. Well, once we've agreed a contract, there will be terms uh, in that contract that we will expect providers to, to meet. That's not to say I want a, a rigid and inflexible uh, system. Um, that There should be flexibility within it to identify where approaches that aren't being uh, as effective as might first have been felt it can, there can be some adjustment or where something is working particularly well that can be uh, enhanced. Um, to go back to your point about the decision, whether it was political or evidence-based, uh, it was evidence-based because, you know, for example, we've seen the jo Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, publish evidence that suggests the, uh, the, uh, the evidence for those who have been sanctioned across a range of jurisdictions, particularly where they are particularly punitive, 
sanctions, the evidence for those individuals getting into long-term sustained employment is limited. And I know that there's also been evidence, I think I'm right in saying, I could be wrong, convener, uh, that this committee has uh, commissioned, I certainly know there was plenty of evidence that the Welfare Reform uh, Committee uh, commissioned to suggest that the efficacy of the uh, particular elements of conditionality, the particular sanction system that UK government is implementing is not as effective as it, the UK government might think it is. But um, uh, so that, that's, that's, um, that's why we're taking uh, the approach we're taking, uh, Mr Lindhurst. But in terms of my commitment to uh, evaluation, it's absolute. In terms of my commitment to, uh, well, it's not even my commitment. If, if this committee or any committee of uh, this parliament wants me to attend, then I have to attend and uh, answer questions about any concerns they have. So if this committee has concerns in the future, I'll be happy to come back and respond to those concerns and either say yes, they're legitimate, or no, I think you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong. So, may, may I just ask, so if so I understood correctly that the contracts you'll be entering into will allow for flexibility to review <coughs> methods and procedures and approaches? It, yes, I wouldn't want to get the sense that there's there, um, there, there, the latitude therein is so flexible that it, it wouldn't... Um, it won't be, because that in itself would make it pretty hard to evaluate. Um, but uh, I don't want, uh, 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 and I don't think the committee or anyone else would want me to see the implementation of a system that's so rigid that if something isn't working, well, we just stick by it anyway. Thank you. Certainly correct about the various reports, certainly, particularly with disabled people. Uh, in the last six years about the sanctions as well. We certainly have Sheffield Hallow and other reports. Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in on this particular issue? And then Ben McPherson. Um, I'm not entirely sure the convener will accept it's connected to this particular issue, but I could begin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that Ben McPherson, so sorry, Alison. Yes, Ben McPherson. <laughs> well, yeah, we all, we all are. <laughs> well, of course, uh, that could love to regret that. <laughs> just trying to keep control of the committee when people... As any in. good convener ben does. McPherson is, uh, thank, thanks, convener. Good, good morning, Minister. Uh, just to, 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 to build on the, th the themes that were, were raised by <coughs> our colleagues in the last two questions, and just to, to supplement what, what, what you said there, actually... Uh, at this committee last week, Rhiannon Sims from Citizen Advice Scotland said that uh, we have not seen uh, in previous employability support uh, provided by the work programmes being particularly helpful in supporting people into work. In fact, sanctions and conditionality are more likely to hinder people's efforts to get into employment. So uh, even just last week, we were, we were hearing evidence to, to, to that effect. I think... Well, I, I, really warmly welcome in the, the letter of 15th of January about the, the shift on the issue of, of, of benefit conditionality and a, a, a move culturally away from a, a system that, that creates fear uh, a, a, around losing benefits to a, a system where that word support in, in, the, in the descriptor of, of these programmes actually means something. And I, I, I would just be really interested on a, on a kind of philosophical basis and on, on, a, on a human basis to hear what you think will be the impact on people uh, having the employability support programs on a voluntary basis and that change of culture uh, to a, a culture of encouragement and support rather than judgment and suspicion. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, hopefully I've, I've uh, set out that um, I think inherent within uh, Mr McPherson's question is uh, that he would uh, concur with uh, that, the evidence that he has gathered. Some of it is, uh, by its nature, anecdotal. I've been out to engage directly with a, a range of organisations. On the day I announced that, um, publicly announced, that we would be taking this approach, I went to meet one parent family, Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh, and there was a clear indication from those I spoke with about the significant concern about... Uh, the sanction system that we have uh, in the UK and uh, the uh, the rigidity of some of the requirements expected of them around their wider circumstances did not speak of a, a very person-centred approach and it did not speak of an approach that sought to give people confidence in uh, themselves and their own ability to get into work through uh, a, a programme that is fundamentally designed to that uh, end. So. 
uh, I suppose you could say that's where the philosophical element uh, comes around because it's informed by my experience of speaking to people and uh, very much from my own constituency postbag uh, in terms of those who uh, have come to me from time to time, too frequently, sadly, if I'm candid with you, who have themselves been subject to uh, sanction or other concerns about the social security system. But above all, it is informed, I have to say, by uh, the uh, academic analysis of which we've, we've referred to in, in question and answer already. Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Sheffield Hallam, uh, who I know did good work for the Welfare Reform Committee. I'm sure we'll continue to do good work, I've asked to, for, for this committee, uh, presenting lots of evidence about the uh, lack of uh, effectiveness of the particular uh, system of conditionality we have here in uh, the UK uh, and uh, Scotland and uh, getting people into long-term sustained employment. And from the, the, the philosophical uh, and the, the, the principled analysis to the, the practical, another issue that was touched on last week was how much time is taken out of both those engaged in the programmes um, and the, the third sector support, the infrastructure around that, how much time, conditionality and sanctions and capacity is engaged in, in dealing with, with those suffering sanctions. Has there been any analysis or consideration around how that extra capacity uh, that will be created by the alleviation of needing to, to deal with conditionality and sanctions will help uh, provide that extra uh, time and, and, and capacity for support instead? I think it's really important for me, again, to emphasise, convener, that those engaging in our programme will still remain subject to conditionality and the potential for sanctions through their interaction with the reserved social security system. What we have achieved here is that our devolved employment programme will not facilitate such. So I think it's important to emphasise that again, Mr McPherson, because people need to, to be cognisant of that. You are correct, of course, though, to say that no longer will a provider have to go through the process of going back to the, the Job Centre Plus DWP to um, talk about compliance, and that will uh, free up uh, some capacity potentially. Um, but uh, I think more fundamentally it's about the um, ability to uh, remove the fear of being sanctioned through engaging in our particular programme that will uh, liberate people uh, to feel confident that this is a programme that's not about trying to get them off of benefit, but is about trying to get them into work. And that's my clear determination through this programme. And then, uh, good morning, Minister. Um, yeah, just since you mentioned specifically the issue of uh, lone parents, one parent families, um, this was raised with us last week specifically. Um, where it was said that the work programmes in the past have not been beneficial for lone parents and that some are seeking a specific package. Now, I know that uh, the employment programmes from April 2018 onwards, um, where um, other vulnerable groups will be looked at. Um, so it's kind of some of the evidence, which I'm sure you've heard yourself from lone parents, is the ability of a single parent to meet some of the conditions, but also because it, the regime that's forced upon them by the DWP is that I think the ch child has to be very, very young. I mean, I think under one years old. If otherwise, you're still expected to seek full-time employment. Um, it doesn't seem to be any... Uh, specific um, it, ways of dealing with that. But I, I know that that's for the DWP, but in relation to the employ, employment uh, programmes, I wondered if you'd given any thought to that. Well, y yes, we have. Uh, I mean, I, again, and you, you've uh, accepted yourself, uh, Deputy Convener, uh, in terms of the uh, the point you make about it's for the DWP to determine the extent of their conditionality and your... I can't alter that in terms of the expectations for lone parents or, or anyone else. I think what you're driving at, and I saw the evidence uh, that was provided to you by, I think it was One Parent Family Scotland, who I've just mentioned a moment ago, where the organisation I went to 
to see uh, when I made the public announcement about um, interaction of the programme with uh, the sanctions regime. I think what you're alluding to there is I think they would provide evidence that there should be a specific strand for lone parents. I can understand why they're calling for that, and I think that's informed very much by their experience of the previous programme. Let me say I'm not, uh, in principle, against such an approach, and I've gone back to the point that we'll continually uh, learn from what we put in place, but what I hope will reassure lone parents, or indeed anyone who takes part in our programme, because any, well, every individual will have unique circumstances around their own lives. It won't just be lone parents. People will have caring responsibilities. People will have certain <laughs> health conditions that can be uh, episodic, which might curb their ability to interact with the programme at certain junctures. That's why my clear ambition is for a person-centred approach. So if a person is a lone parent, then that very much needs to be taken into account by the providers we uh, uh, provide a contract to for the provision of this service when they set out how they will support that individual into employment. That, I think, will lessen the requirement for a specific strand for lone parents because we are seeking a person-centred approach for each and every person who interacts with this programme. Okay. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, you wanted to come in on that, and then you had a question as well. Sure. Yeah, thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, committee heard from Damien Green about the UK government's work, health and disability, Green Paper, um, improving lives. I'm just interested to know if the Scottish government intends to respond to that paper and if so, what are the points you'll be making about it? it yeah, yes, we do uh, intend to respond. Um, it will be a joint response between uh, myself and uh, Jean Freeman as the Minister for Social Security and Aileen Campbell as the Minister for Public Health and Sport because the areas uh, within uh, that green paper touch all of our uh, portfolios. Um, we will be responding to it because there are clear implications, not least through uh, the amount being expended on that programme by the UK government for what we will receive as a consequence for our uh, employment programme here, because I've referred to the, the cut in funding. What's driven that is the move towards uh, the, the new uh, programme that the UK government is seeking to put in place for England uh, and Wales with a significant funding cut for programmes there. So yes, we'll be responding. I should say, as much as I have concerns, and there are real concerns about the implications for funding, in terms of what's been set out in their green paper, much of it I actually welcome, because much of it's about around the same agenda that we are determined to pursue around integration and alignment. Uh, of course, and I, I equally recognise this is as true of uh, myself and the Scottish Government, as it is of Damien Green and the UK Government, um, the, the proof will be in uh, the pudding. And, well, inevitably, um, integration alignment might mean one thing here in Scotland for us and another for the UK Government uh, in terms of uh, their uh, ambitions. But in terms of the high-level principle of uh, integrating and aligning services, in particular in this instance with uh, health, uh, I think that's a sensible thing for the UK government to be seeking to do. Yeah, I, th I think when, when he was at committee, I did welcome, I, th I think the words, uh, you, you would be hard pushed to argue with, with, with what's being said. I suppose I'm just interested to hear a little bit more. I mean, it's an 87% cut to employability. So for all, we can we can welcome the the tone and the, and the, and the, the warmth of the intentions in it, what impact is that going to have on disabled people and long-term unemployed and both, you know, gaining the skills and support to, to not just get a job but to sustain a, a job, which is what we want for, for folk? No escaping, there is a practical impact. We have obviously taken a decision to try and mitigate the effects of that reduction in spending by leveraging an additional resource from existing uh, Scottish Government resources, uh, but even allowing for that, 
um, it, it's hard to escape that there is a practical effect insofar as there is a reduced amount to expend on this new employment programme. Uh, so that's a challenge. And th I think, to be fair, there's been widespread acceptance from the sector that there is a challenge. That's not to say there aren't opportunities and by necessity. I mean, it's a, it strikes me as a sensible thing to do. So even if we'd had the same level of funding, which we don't, it's a substantial reduction in funding, as uh, you allude to, uh, Ms. Maguire. But even if there wasn't a reduction in funding, it would be a very sensible thing to do to align and integrate services. But with this reduction in finance, I think that speaks uh, even more of the necessity to do so. But yes, there is, um, there is a, a substantial challenge as a consequence of that reduction in funding. Okay, thank you. George Adams. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. Uh, I'd like to ask about the DWP office closures because you have mentioned it both in your evidence here today and your letter of January 25th. But it's two points in particular I'd like to ask you initially. Uh, the two points being the, the, the shocking lack of communication from the UK government on this, this situation and the impact uh, that this would have on how you are going to deliver the programmes that you've set out here today. You know, if that communication issue continued and things kept going the way they were, would that cause you problems uh, in programme uh, kind of uh, distribution? Again, it would pose a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I think we would find ways to surmount that challenge, but yes, it doesn't make it easier. Uh, I think the real concern we have here is the impact of people on the ground, both primarily service users through the front-facing uh, job centres that will be uh, closed, uh, but also, and I'm aware this will be of a concern to, to you, Mr Adam, in terms of uh, backhouse uh, function, which support uh, the, the front-facing uh, element for the, the staff at an uncertain time uh, as well. Um, so it certainly doesn't make it easier uh, there are challenges I think we can um, we can overcome, but we'll be able to overcome it more readily and more easily if the terms of paragraph 58 of the Smith Agreement, which I've already quoted from, uh, become more meaningful. Um, I, this has been raised with um, the Department of Work and Pension. I raised it directly with Damien Green at the last meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, uh, which was held in London last year. Uh, which I attended along with uh, Angela Constance, uh, and I very much pressed the point that we needed to make significant progress towards making that, uh, the, what's set out in that paragraph, real and meaningful. There was a commitment for discussions between our officials to do so. There have been those discussions, but clearly this process, the way these job closures, uh, job centre closures, I should say, have been announced says quite clearly to me that we need to make further progress still um, of um, greater joint governance arrangements are to be laid out then I think that has to involve and, and let me say I, I recognise that paragraph 50 I'm sure this would be a perspective that Mr Adam would share I think we should have I think that Job Centre Plus should be a devolved function and we should have full discretion over how it's managed here in Scotland. I recognise that's not where we are. So I recognise in paragraph 58 it remains a reserve function. But it does talk about co-location of services and it talks about that greater role for joint uh, governance. If that's to be meaningful, then uh, where the Department of Work and Pensions have proposals in mind, they should speak to us about them first. So we can raise concerns about the likely impact of uh, closures so that we can say, well, if you're determined to press ahead with them, how can we mitigate the effect of those uh, closures by co-locating services? Skills Development Scotland is one that uh, I've posited. Um, local authorities would probably want to uh, have a role to play in that regard as well through the local services they provide. So we can only engage in that type of dialogue if we know these proposals are coming. Uh, and it might be that we still hold to position that we think the proposals are wrong and they shouldn't go ahead. And certainly in this instance, I think the case has definitively not been made. The case for these 
job centre closures seems to be entirely predicated on the fact that existing lease arrangements are coming to an end, so we're going to close the particular job centres. That seems to me to be a peculiar way of determining where a specific job centre should be located. Undoubtedly, it is the case convener that, because we do it as well as an administration, you will review your estate, you will see is that specific office the specific one that we want to continue running a service from, but surely what you do when you're running a service such as Job Centre Plus, he says, well, what community should be served? It might not be that specific set of bricks and mortar, but that's a community we want to serve. So we may have to move office, but somewhere nearby. That would be my starting assumption. No. That would be why I'd like to see it devolved so we could take a more common sense approach. On that point, Minister. Could, could I just say, we're supposed to finish this session at 10.30. If the Minister's minded, it's an important subject. Uh, and obviously lots of questions being forward. We would run it another five minutes. Would that be acceptable for, for the Minister to... So, so, long as so? I can, so long as I can get away from my dinner at some point, can Absolutely. Be, I'm happy well, obviously to stay. we have private session as well. Uh, but I just wanted to say that uh, thank you very much for running on the extra five minutes. A couple of people want to come in. There's no problem. But in certain, the, the, you know, the back room offices, as you call it, in my particular constituency, Port Carlos House and uh, Cadogan Street yep. is huge. And it's not, it doesn't just serve the Kelvin constituency, it serves out with Glasgow oh, and Glasgow absolutely. as well. And that's, you know, I think that it's really important that when you were saying you're having a conversation, you raise these issues because if you're closing the job centres and you're closing where people go to be assessed for DLA and PIP, where are they going to go? Well, and I think that's a huge issue, which obviously Mr Adam and others will probably Can I just raise. get a supplementary no, on the back of that? Sorry, I wasn't stopping you, Mr Adam. I'm just letting you in. OK, okay on you go. Uh, basically, the, I was going to, you've already mentioned, uh, I just want to go on about what you said at the end there. You mentioned about the Paisley Loan End call centre, mm -hmm. where effectively 300 jobs are getting ripped out of the community mm -hmm. by the right-wing Tory government. Uh, now, this is effectively a short-sighted move, in my opinion, because, as you quite rightly said, uh, they're taking all these people who are local to that area, and at best, they may be redistributed somewhere else within the DWP, or at worst, there could be threats. And that's a concern as well. But one of the things that you mentioned as well that is really, really important, and I'm led to believe that it's not just some of the leases that are coming up with the DWP, uh, it's all of them that are coming up. So are we at a stage here where this is actually the small end of it and there could be more yet to come from this Tory government? Well, I, I can't answer that, uh, Mr Adam, because I, uh, I think um, the process thus far indicates that some of these, well, all of the specific uh, closures were not known to me in advance of them being announced. So um, I, I've no indication that there will be further, but it'd be wrong of me to definitively say here and now that there won't be more. Can I also just, uh, just in finishing, uh, just say the fact that we, we were told that when Damien Green was here that there should be ongoing dialogue with absolutely everything. And uh, him and I had a robust conversation and I would, discussion. I would expect nothing less from Well, it was. Time. And uh, we got to the stage where he said he would try and be open. But we're here at a situation where myself, 300 <laughs> jobs, you know, yourself mm -hmm. as the minister mm -hmm. involved in the process mm -hmm. haven't been communicated. But like, that's absolutely shocking. Well, it, it's, uh, it, yes, indeed, it's disappointing to say the least. And it also is, um, I think, will lead to poorer outcomes because we could, if we engage in meaningful dialogue, then we can, we can, as I say, seek to, well, we would continue to raise concerns if we fundamentally disagree with a particular proposition. I do not think the case has been made here. There's been no equality impact assessments undertaken in these proposals, for example. And we'll debate this issue next week, and these might be matters uh, germane and pertinent to the debate we will have. But um, yes, I think that, that uh, certainly early dialogue would allow us to say, well, you know, here's how we can continue to have some form of provision in communities to help people into to work. That can only happen if we have meaningful dialogue. And I use the term meaningful dialogue deliberately because I have watched from afar the response of <coughs> DWP ministers to uh, some of, well, as we would say, my co our colleagues, Mr Adam, who are 
members of the UK Parliament who similarly have concerns about the impact of closures in their areas, and the response will come back and say there has been dialogue between officials, Scottish government officials and UK government officials about co-location. Well, that's true, but it still resulted in a set of circumstances where my officials, Skills Development Scotland, and myself as a minister with responsibility for employability and training, was first finding out about the closures in Glasgow through uh, the newspapers uh, the, the day it was uh, revealed to the, the rest of the world. And with the subsequent raft of closures, I should say again, they will say, well, um, there was some prior notification. What happened was we got a phone call the night before. Damien Hines phoned um, uh, one of my colleagues, Ms Constance, and um, said, oh, there'll be an announcement tomorrow. And that was it. No, and my officials tried to explore it further. Where are you talking about? What areas, what communities are you talking about? And we were told, we were told, you know, watch, uh, watch the House of Commons uh, live feed at one o'clock. Well, that's, that's, that's really helpful, you know. We can I, do what everyone else can do. I'm still waiting for communication from the DWP regarding it. I'm, I'm led to believe that my parliamentary colleagues down in Westminster had to chase the ministers themselves to get something in writing from them. But just, I would say, convener, this is maybe something we could look into, the inquiry, the inquiry with the committee, with the idea of these DWP office closures, because I think it's an important issue, and it's one that's going to go on and on, and it could possibly get worse, because as I said, I'm led to believe by the union that we could have all the state is effectively coming to the end of its lease, so who knows what could be next. Thank you, George. Adam Tomkins, you wanted to come in slightly. I just wanted just to give quickly the min one. minister the opportunity slightly to correct the record in uh, response to Ruth Maguire's question, because, which was about an 87% budget cut. And of course, it is the case, isn't it, Minister, that um, this year's budget for the Scottish Government is the biggest since the dawn of devolution and is £500 million greater than last year's budget. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to recognise that those facts are indeed true. Well, you've given me the opportunity to. Uh, put on record that we've still not come to conclusion through the fiscal uh, framework negotiations as to what the final settlement for this specific programme will be. But every indication we have had but this year's is that is the, uh, the amount of money that will come to us as a consequence. And, and you know, I think it's a very interesting approach, Mr. Tompkins, because I hear regularly from Conservative uh, MSPs that. This is the amount of funding that's coming for a specific purpose. Will you disperse it for that specific purpose? Well, here we are still await the final settlement for this specific purpose, but every indication we've had thus far indicates it will be an unprecedented uh, and substantial reduction in funding, something I'm sure I'd, I'd very much welcome Mr Tompkins taking up with his colleague, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in, and that's the last question. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, the government's A New Future for Employability Support in Scotland document says that support will be offered through a flexible, tailored, whole-person approach. I appreciate that and your comments this morning, um, uh, referring to how sanctions were not the best way to, to, to get the best out of people. I agree with that entirely, but I think it is fair to say that there are, you know, there are groups of people who face particular challenges and um, have you considered that part of the solution for those who are getting what may be considered and is by many too little support at the moment might be a set of minimum standards um, that they can lay claim to? Has there been any discussion of that rights-based approach? Um, work pro programme providers, for example, do issue minimum standards, but it seems that frequently they're ignored. So I just wondered if Workable Scotland uh, work for Scotland and future programmes would have a set of rights for services. If that's something that's been considered, and if so, how would they be enforced? Yes, they will be, because there's, um, uh, um, there will be contractual obligations on service providers, and if they fail to meet that collectively or for an individual, then that's clearly something we will take an interest in. So there will be rights in that sense for service users. We are also will will have embedded in the system um, a process whereby uh, anyone interacting with our service, they, can, they will understand the, uh, 
the uh, what the provider has to provide for them, but also what's expected of them, them uh, as well. Um, you know, we will want people to uh, engage. Uh, if they're there, they're engaging willingly, but they obviously have to maintain uh, that commitment to engage willingly with our uh, service. Um, I believe people will do that, um, but people obviously have to, to agree to that. But yes, people will have uh, rights that uh, should be respected in this uh, process. Okay. Uh, in terms of your point about uh, differing uh, need, that is going to be embedded within the system as well. Uh, and so far as we recognise some people will need lower levels of, of support and can probably proceed quicker into the labour market. And we recognise that some people will require uh, more intensive uh, support and our uh, scheme will be uh, designed to uh, allow for that. Again, speaking of the, the need for a very person-centred approach. There's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that too often work programmes don't result in a long-term career path or you know, people are often almost forced into work in the short term, which doesn't last, it's perhaps on, it's insecure. Um, and within three to six months, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that two thirds of people are unemployed once more. Um, um, there's obviously an opportunity here to use employment programmes to promote social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, how are the government connecting up, you know, existing Scottish government priorities with the opportunity we have here through the employment programme? Well, that, that, that obviously goes back to our agenda of uh, integration alignment. We've got the specific pot of money to try and uh, test out ways that we will do that, that we will continue to engage in dialogue to do that. I think you, uh, Ms Johnson, hits on a fundamentally important point, though, because it is important to try and support people to, to be in sustained employment, and there will be an element of in-work support in our programme as well. So it's not like you've you've hit the 12-month mark, you get your final payment, and that's it. So um, there will be, uh, for those who require it, continued in-work support as well. Thank you, convener. Th thank you very much, Minister, and for taking the extra time for, for the questions. Uh, thank you. We now close the meeting and move into private session. Thank you.